I'm thrilled to announce um, and Dr. Nicholas Embleton will be our expert speaker for our next webinar on July 29th. Please mark your calendars and join us for a presentation by Dr. Embleton on nutritional status and gut health in preterm infants. What is it and how do we assess it? So let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed presenters and experts in the field of neonatal nutrition and growth, Dr. Tannis Fenton and Dr. Bill Hay. We'll have time for questions at the end, so please feel free to post your questions throughout the presentation in the question box at the bottom of your screen. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Fenton to get us started. Thank you, Tammy, and good day to everyone uh, who has logged on. So today, <clears throat> Bill and I are going to be talking about metrics that matter, growth assessment of preterm infants. So in terms of disclosures, I am consulting with this company, Astarte Medical, and in terms of other financial relationships, I uh, have had some funding from independent uh, groups, and I do receive some licensing fees through Innovate Calgary, which is a, um, a branch of our university that assists me with licensing opportunities of my growth chart data. So the work that you all do in nourishing and supporting preterm infants is very important, particularly because these babies cannot decide how much they need to eat. We are having to make those decisions for them. So their growth assessment is incredibly important because we need that feedback about how well we are supporting these infants. So I'll be addressing the question today, is the baby growing well? Preterm infants and the fetus grow very, very fast. In the last eight weeks of pregnancy or in eight weeks of preterm infant life after the postnatal weight loss phase, both of these groups double their weight in about eight weeks. In comparison, a term newborn infant takes about four months to double their weight. And teenagers, who we often think of as growing very fast, actually take nine to 11 years to double their weight. And if we look at what happens in the last four months of pregnancy from 23 weeks to 40 weeks, the fetus multiplies its weight six times. And in comparison for the first four months of a term infant's life, on average, infants double their weight in that time. There's a lot of individual vari variation, but on average, they double their weight. We think of teenagers as growing very fast. There are lots of jokes about them eating us out of house and home and eating everything that they can see. We think of them as growing fast. They seem to grow right in front of our eyes, but they actually take years to double their weight. Teen boys double their weight from roughly 11 to 20 years of age and girls double in roughly nine to 20 years of age. Here's a growth velocity chart that shows grams per kilo per day. Now I'm not advocating using grams per kilo per day after term at all. In fact, I'll talk later about how long I think we should use it. But just to show you a comparison of grams per kilo per day for the fetus and for teens and girls and boys are there and they're uh, one superimposed on the other, you can hardly see a difference. So at the peak growth velocity, in um, at, at about 30 weeks of gestation, infants are growing at about 30, uh, sorry, about uh, 18, 17 to 18 grams per kilo per day. And then growth velocity is actually dropping extremely rapidly up to term. Term is indicated by the vertical red bar. And growth velocity continues to drop very rapidly until three years of age. And then the teenage growth spurt in terms of grams per kilo per day doesn't even show up on this graph. So I'm showing you three case studies that I will 
uh, lead you through today. How should you assess these three babies' growth? So the first baby, oh, I think it jumped to my answers at the bottom. Okay, uh, so the first baby is born at about the 25th percentile for weight and for length and then has a postnatal weight loss phase and then begins to grow parallel to the growth curves and uh, the background growth curves are, are my growth curves. And then at 36 weeks of gestational age, this baby's weight is at the seventh percentile. And the literature considers that a baby who has uh, a weight less than the 10th percentile has growth failure. And you can see that this baby's length and head circumference are growing nicely parallel to the growth curves after an initial setback in the early weeks where the baby wasn't keeping up, but then began keeping up. The second baby is born at about the same percentile, about the 25th percentile, has a postnatal weight loss phase. And then the baby's both weight and length gain are deviating away from the growth curves and the literature would define a child that is growing slower than the intrauterine rate as having growth failure. The third case, the, this baby has regained its birth percentile. In our cohort of roughly a thousand babies, we've found that only about nine or ten percent of the babies do regain their birth percentile. The literature implies and actually states in a few studies that this is desirable. And you can see that the length is roughly growing roughly parallel to the 10th percentile, uh, but the weight has exceeded and uh, the baby was born at around the 60th percentile for weight and at 36 weeks also has a weight at 36 weeks. So my opinions are different. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see my opinions. First of all, this baby that is discharged with a weight at the seventh percentile, this is an extremely frequent occurrence uh, that we see among preterm babies having a weight less than the 10th percentile at, at, at 36 weeks. The second baby whose growth is not parallel to the intrauterine rate, I would consider to have growth failure. And the third baby who has a growth rate in terms of weight greater than the intrauterine rate, I would say this is an unusual finding, not the desirable finding, just an unusual one. So what I would recommend to you if you have a baby that has a discharge weight less than uh, the 10th percentile or who is growing less than the 10th percentile. It's a very common occurrence and I don't see a concern with this. After that postnatal weight loss, which is mostly water, this is a common occurrence and I'll be discussing this further today. I suggest that you aim as best you can to keep nutrition as per the recommendations and maintain growth monitoring. We don't want to see this baby falter. It, the baby's doing just fine in my opinion. This second baby that I define as having growth failure, first of all, maintain your growth and nutrition, your growth monitoring and your nutrition support. Keep nutrition at the recommendations. We don't have evidence to give more than the recommended amounts. And then I think it's worth asking the question, is there an explanation for this poor growth? It could be that this baby has had a severe intraventricular hemorrhage. The baby may have severe nutrition intolerances. And if this is occurring at any kind of frequency in your unit, then I encourage you to evaluate your unit's nutrition protocol. So the baby that ended up regaining the birth percentile, I recommend that you keep this baby at the recommended in nutrition intakes. And then as the baby progresses to nipple feedings, I would encourage you to ensure that the baby's being fed according to his or her appetite and feeding cues. And 
as babies go from being completely under our care for nutrition support to their own eating and eating by appetite, we need to encourage parents to allow the child to determine the amount, whether they're premature or not, that the best thing to aim for is to feed infants as to their hunger and satiety cues and maintain growth monitoring. If this baby was overfed in, in the NICU, then this baby might then drift down to slightly lower percentiles. On the other hand, this baby might have had interuterine growth restriction, even though the birth percentile was at the 60th percentile, maybe this baby should have been on the 97th percentile, given the child's genetic potential. And if so, then this baby will continue to um, gain more weight and length and grow bigger. The main thing is we need to be monitoring to see what the baby is going to do and support them. So I wanted to talk, and uh, Tammy actually asked that I specifically talk about extra uterine growth restriction, which is often sometimes called postnatal growth failure. It's usually defined as having a weight less than the 10th percentile on a growth chart. And so it's defined the same way as intrauterine growth restriction. And um, a study that we published three years ago, we conducted, a group of us conducted a systematic review where we're looking at the methods that are used to growth, uh, monitor growth of preterm infants. And one of the questions we addressed was, um, you know, which studies have addressed the question about postnatal growth failure or ex extrauterine growth restriction. And these are the years of publication. It was first suggested as a term in 1982. And you can see that we almost have a nice exponential curve of increase in the publication of papers using this term or these terms, there are two terms. But I'd like to present to you that there are five reasons that are possible disadvantages to using extrauterine growth restriction as a development screening test. I'm proposing that it is being used as, as a development screening test in the literature and perhaps in some units. And I propose that there are five reasons why this is undesirable. This reference at the bottom is a paper we just had published in March and the uh, the web link is where you can download the uh, paper for no, no cost. So the possible disadvantages to using UGR as a developmental screening test are, first of all, it's based on an arbitrary statistical cutoff. The 10th percentile was arbitrarily selected. Second, it's usually based only on weight without any consideration of how the baby's doing in terms of head growth or length growth, proportionality, body composition, or their genetic potential. It ignores the normal postnatal weight loss that most, but not all babies go through. And then it misses seeing the trend towards catch up that some studies have observed that occurs between uh, starts to occur between 36 and 44 weeks postmenstrual age and most importantly it's not predictive of having an adverse cognitive outcome this graph uh, published by neil rojo and colleagues shows growth patterns of babies who are born between 25 and 30 five weeks of gestational age. The background black curves are my growth chart. And you can see I've identified the 10th percentile. So at the bottom is the third percentile, then the 10th, the 50th, 90th, and 97th percentile. So for each of these growth patterns, I've identified the median. The line in the middle of the growth patterns in the colorful areas is the median or the middle child in that group. So as we see in any NICU, there is a variation in size of children. The colored area, the shaded area, is 
the interquartile range, which is from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile. So that's 50% of the babies are in that uh, shaded area. And then the horizontal, sorry, the vertical lines in each of those growth patterns, the bottom of the, hor of the vertical lines is the 10th percentile and the top is the 90th percentile. So going back to the shaded area, the bottom of that shaded area is the 25th percentile. So 25% of the babies are below that shaded area. And you can see that each of these growth patterns as babies go through their postnatal weight loss and then start to grow, 25% of them approximately weighed less than the 25th percentile. But a point that needs to be made about the infants in this study was that they were selected for not having any adverse health circumstances from the pregnancy or after birth. They had very minimal requirements for oxygen. They had no morbidities. And in each of the units where these infants were raised, they had their nutrition protocolized. So even amongst these very healthy infants, it was quite normal for 25% to have their weight below the 10th percentile. There have been four studies that actually address the question about whether extrauterine growth restriction is predictive of cognitive outcomes. And these studies are listed here as well as their findings. And all four of them found no association between having weight below the 10th percentile and cognitive outcomes. Three of them looked at the Bailey and one of them used a developmental scale. So for preterm infants, what type of growth is associated with poor neurodevelopment? So I've listed the authors and the years here for studies that have documented what has been associated with poor neurodevelopment. And first of all, low rates of gain and head growth have been associated with poor outcome. For example, Richard Ehrenkrantz, 2006, Six study is quite well known and they found that the lowest quartile or the bottom quarter of their sample had poor uh, for growth had poor neurodevelopmental outcomes so they didn't compare these studies didn't compare to a growth chart they didn't specify a percentile but for this analysis, but they did find that the babies who were doing poorest in terms of growth, whether it was weight or head growth, had uh, poor developmental outcomes. Also, numerous studies have document that, documented that having a small size uh, in terms of weight or head circumference after term, so between three to 24 months corrected age, had poor outcomes. And these are often below the third percentile. But what has not been associated, this last point is summarizing what that previous slide had uh, shown you more details. These four studies that address this question about weight less than the 10th percentile at around 36 weeks, it was, it was not predictive of poor developmental outcomes. So I want to switch quickly and say a few words about growth velocity. Growth velocity is very useful to point out uh, how the baby has grown over a period of time and it's commonly used for research. So this graph is showing the grams per kilo per day for preterm infants um, based on growth references that are commonly used. So my growth chart, Irene Olson's intergrowth, the, and the WHO growth standard. The blue horizontal line is showing 15 grams per kilo per day, which has commonly been recommended over time in the past. And you can see that I've circled 15 to 20 grams per kilo to, per day, which both my growth chart and Irene Olson's supports up to about 35 or 36 weeks of gestational age. You can see that the intergrowth estimate for growth velocity is very, very high prior to 33 weeks of gestational age where they had uh, almost no data. So it, there's not a lot of confidence in that, in that data. But after 36 weeks, you can see that 
even 15 grams per kilo per day is too high compared to what we'd expect from these growth charts. So go on to the next one. In terms of grams per day from these same growth references, you can see that the grams per day uh, growth changes very, very rapidly from 23 to 33 weeks of gestation. So in my opinion, grams per day isn't a very useful parameter for this age because the expected grams per day growth is changing very rapidly. After 33 weeks, you can see that both um, or all, all of the growth references other than um, the last few weeks for Irene Olson's and the first weeks of the WHO um, are very deviant, but the rest suggest that somewhere um, between or around an average of 30 grams per day is appropriate. Now, this is boys and girls averaged together, and boys on average gain a little bit faster than girls. What about head growth? So head growth in centimeters per week, one centimeter per week is often recommended. And you can see that that's actually a high estimate compared to growth charts. After 30 weeks, uh, it looks like that's too high of a goal for preterm infants. In terms of length, centimeter per week, uh, the one centimeter per week is often quoted. And you can see that that's too low of a goal for babies below about 38 weeks and above 38 weeks. It actually is a bit too high. One problem or real limitation to using a calculation of growth velocity like grams per kilo per day is that it is just a snapshot about that time interval that you are plotting. And here's the growth pattern of a little boy who had been born just under the 50th percentile and then his weight at 36 weeks was around the fifth percentile. And you can see that he had a normal kind of variation in his weight. Now, if you calculate his growth velocity for week 32, it's only eight grams per kilo per day. And you might be quite concerned if you see a, a growth velocity that low. But the week before, he had a very high growth velocity of 24 grams per kilo per day. So he likely is retaining fluids at that point in time. So growth velocity is, it can be a useful tool, but a better tool, I think, is to look at the growth pattern of the infant on a growth chart, because that gives you a much fuller picture of how that baby is growing. Plus, you can also look at their length and head circumference growth at the same time. So in summary, what I recommend about using growth velocity calculations is for grams per kilo per day, aim for 15 to 20 grams per kilo per day up to 36 weeks of gestational age. But then from 36 weeks of postmenstrual age to two months corrected age, aim for grams per day of 20 to 35. The so growth velocity can be a useful adjunct to observing growth on growth charts, but it doesn't replace it. And remember that grams per kilo per day and grams per day both ignore whether the infant grew differently the week before. And then it's most useful to calculate growth velocity after the postnatal weight phase. And we've found that day seven is a nice time to begin using growth velocity calculations if you wish to use them. And it's best not to use time periods shorter than five days because of the great variations there are in weight gain. Uh, we recommend using the average two-point method to calculate growth velocity and the early one-point method where you just divide by the weight at the beginning of the time period uh, overestimates growth velocity, so should not be used for research. So looking again at these three babies, I propose to you that you really get the best understanding of an infant's growth by looking at their growth patterns for all three parameters. And in summary, I suggest aim for a sustained pattern of growth rather than any specific achieved weight and aim for growth that's approximately parallel to the growth chart curves. And if an infant is deviating importantly from the expected growth patterns, just 
do a double check, a triple check to ensure your nutrition is optimized and assess for other contributing factors. I wanted to just mention briefly about the pre-B dietary guidelines for Americans. A group of us have been uh, working hard on conducting systematic reviews for this project, which is referred to as the Pre-B project. And the good news is that the work is mostly completed and uh, our findings and recommendations are currently undergoing peer review. So we hope to be able to share them broadly very soon. So my take home messages uh, with my grandchildren on the side are do not assess your children for uh, and growth restriction aim to meet nutritional needs for everyone and examine your growth monitoring methods to see if they are ideal. So thank you very much and I'll pass you on to Bill. Thank you very much, Tammy. Can I, here, how do I get my figures on here? Upload? Yep, Just, yep. open them up, Bill, and there yep. you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm going to talk to you about strategies to promote postnatal growth of preterm infants and prevent postnatal growth faltering. And I apologize for some of you who haven't been able to hear this. We will have this recorded uh, with the figures. And oh, I have disclosures like uh, Tannis did. I do consult for Astarte. I receive honoraria for a bunch of lectures I give all over the place. And I'm an editor of a textbook. So uh, Tannis has nicely described how one should more optimally assess growth rates. And I'm going to, in response, address the following points about what normal human fetal growth rate is, normal variances, how we're going to meet this. Does it matter if we achieve normal fetal growth rates? Why aren't we doing as well as we could and should? What are the nutritional, uh, uh, nutritional requirements, at least for macronutrients, to meet, meet the fetal growth rate? What are some of the consequences of not meeting the growth rate? an assessment of nutrition and growth that I'll follow up on with and uh, com continue with the uh, nutritional recommendations from the uh, American Academy guidelines that have just been published. So what is normal human fetal growth rate? And I think you can see very easily from this figure here that with many, many different growth charts and growth assessments, and I've just listed a bunch here on the right, and you can see their growth figures here here that uh, over 75,000 infants or uh, less than 33 weeks are included in uh, these charts. And regardless, therefore, of the growth curve, birth weight by gestational age is relatively constant from about 26 to 36 weeks at an average growth rate that varies among studies from about 15 to 20 grams per kilo per day. And Walter Mihach from Germany, uh, if you see the dark boxes and uh, start dark line, uh, his uh, average on a large number of babies in his NICU was uh, 17 grams per kilo per day. Some of you are, uh, have followed the uh, Intergrowth 21st Project preterm growth charts. You can see they have wider variance, probably because they're a pooled international population uh, that they've included. You can see that their uh, babies at the lower end of gestational age are relatively small, perhaps from small mothers that, that were included. But I think the other thing that Tannis already referred to is that they have very limited data. So you can see here, there's only 28 infants in uh, less than 33 weeks and only 12, nine boys and three girls that were less than 32 weeks. And data at that range uh, with such few numbers is not normally distributed. So not a, uh, quite as accurate as the other charts at all. So what are normal variances in human fetal growth rate? Um, very clearly, some babies are bigger and some babies are smaller. And these are normal babies. Normal large for gestational age babies have more rapid growth. They require more protein and energy. Normal small for gestational age babies grow slower and have lower, lower protein and energy requirements. But if you scale their uh, growth and their nutrient requirements to their body weight, they fill right in with the AGA infants. But that's for normal large average or small babies. Some small babies and some large babies are not normal. They already are pathologically undergrown. They had intrauterine growth restriction or overgrown with macrosomia. These babies need to be figured out as best we can because they don't belong in growth curves. They, are, they will skew all growth curves 
uh, based on birth measurements. And their responses to normal nutritional intakes won't produce normal rates of growth. For example, so let's look at the IUGR baby, the one that was a fetus with growth restriction. These babies, because of placental insufficiency, experience metabolic adaptations to chronic undernutrition. They have long-term adaptations, include less insulin, reduced protein synthesis, and net balance capacity. They have fewer myocytes, as in one example, uh, of uh, cellular uh, changes. And they this is all in relationship to producing normal cellular energy and oxidative metabolism at the expense of go uh, growth. So you can see this baby born at uh, 28 weeks, weighing less than 500 grams, was already chronically growth restricted and could not grow very well, despite receiving the same nutrition as an appropriate for gestational age preterm infant. Growth is an energy dependent process and uh, sacrificing growth to normalize cellular metabolism is what these babies appear to do. This can be a chronic adaptation that can lead to long-term co complications. So the question for our normal preterm babies that otherwise would grow very well, is that they do, uh, if they receive chronically insufficient nutrition after birth, will they develop the same persistent reduced growth capacity as the IUGR fetuses did. So how are we doing to meet the normal fetal growth rate? And for many uh, preterm infants in the past, and you can see in the green lines there, the National Institute of Child Health and Development uh, curves, uh, they weren't doing very well. They all were developing postnatal slowing of growth or growth faltering. Uh, this was improved, a study by Tannis Fenton in 2013 showed in the dotted lines improved growth, uh, particularly by starting nutrition on the day of birth. But even these curves show that growth rates of extremely very preterm infants less than 30 weeks were still less than the normal fetal growth rates. So does it matter if we achieve normal fetal growth rates with appropriate nutrition in preterm infants, particularly in the first week of life? And the answer is obviously yes. And this comes from a lot of studies now. Uh, I only show you one right here. It's just one striking example. Looking at first week, first week after birth, protein and energy intakes that are associated with 18 month developmental outcomes. And every one gram per kilo per day increase in protein intake during that first week was associated with an approximate eight point increase in uh, mental developmental index at 18 months. And every 10 kcals per kilo per day of total energy increase in, was associated with about a five point increase in MDI. That's fairly striking uh, in a single baby as well as in a population of babies. The other fundamental point is that preterm babies are in critical developmental stage. Here we're looking at a study from Sarah Rammel's group out of Minnesota. Uh, processing speed is a measure of cognition at uh, four years and showing that uh, this was positively, the blue line there, uh, related to uh, fat-free mass gain. Um, that was very nice to see. But if you then look at the term infants, it was not seen. That's the red line. Uh, so these preterm babies are at a critical developmental stage where proper nutrition, uh, in this case protein to produce increased fat-free mass, is going to produce significant effects on cognition that doesn't show up at term when they're not in quite as a uh, uh, critical stage of development. So why don't preterm infants always grow as the normal fetus does? Well, I think one of the main reasons is that uh, they don't get adequate nutrition. And this is evidenced as shown very nicely in this figure by cumulative, and I'll come back to that word, cumulative deficits in both energy and protein. And this was true even when more aggressive or more optimal nutrition was provided, shown by those arrows uh, from in, in this particular study. What are the causes of inadequate nutrition in preterm infants? Well, we often delay start to providing nutrients. We're doing better these days, but it was the case in the past that no intravenous amino acids were provided in the first few days of life and then very slowly increased half a gram per kilo per day, every day to every other day. Enteral feedings were often held sometimes for days and then started at very low rates uh, and then advanced at very slow rates. And often dilute nutritional mixes are used, particularly uh, unfortified milk, whether it's mother's own or banked, 
and the several of the TPM mixes that are used from commercial support sources are relatively low in certain essential amino acids. So those are the facts. But on rounds, I have a lot have had a lot of fun just collecting stories from uh, residents, nurses, colleagues about why feeding was stopped or held or reduced in babies. And these are just amazing. They go on and on and on. Uh, look at number one, abdominal distension. I don't know of any preterm baby that doesn't at one point or another have abdominal distension. And sure, we worry about feeding intolerance in NEC, but most of the time we can just go ahead and feed. Gastric aspirates, especially the green ones, well, that's not shown to be uh, worth paying attention to. To go ahead and feed is a better approach. You can keep on reading through some of these. Gastroesophageal reflux, PBAs, high BUNs, uh, various meta conditions, uh, catecholamines, uh, transfusions on a ventilator. How does that reduce digestion and nutrient absorption and anabolism? Low energy expenditure. This one has always baffled me. Of course, it's low if the baby is undernourished. And, and can, continuing on with these, uh, there's more and more of these, and, and it gets to be a lot of fun. The reasons seem to be never ending. The uh, point is, all of these excuses, justified or not, reduce nutrient intake at critical stages of development, which limits growth with increased potential for long lasting adverse outcomes. And one cannot say that factors other than undernutrition, such as the many illnesses and pathophysiological processes and their treatments, are responsible for inadequate growth until one is provided appropriate and sufficient nutrition to meet the nutrient requirements of the normally growing human fetus. What are these requirements? First for me is protein, the only nutrient substrate that produces structural growth. And this is true in all tissues and all organs, as I've shown you there. And if you look at the figure, look at how much of body length growth or body weight growth over uh, the, sec the last third of gestation is lean mass. You can't grow lean mass without protein. How much protein? This is a really nice sort of meta-analysis study by Nick Embleton. Uh, all of those dots is in, are individual studies. And the studies line up absolutely on a straight line. And they very clearly show that you need at least one and a half grams per kilo per day of protein intake to produce growth or nitrogen retention. And you need up to three and a half grams per kilo per day as a minimum to produce, guess what? 300 milligrams of nitrogen retention per kilo per day, which is, guess what? Two grams per kilo per day of protein gain. And that's right back to where we started 17 grams per kilo per day of body weight gain. It's nice to see how this all is consistent. But the key is the right amount at the right gestational age. Very early in gestation that we're taking care of our preterm babies, 20 to 28 weeks, fractional protein synthetic rate is very high to meet the higher fractional growth rate. But by term, protein requirements decrease to those of the normal breastfed infant, around one and a half to as, most, as much as two grams per kilo per day. And then we also have to consider the duration uh, of how we're providing our early nutrition. Uh, this is total protein intake, and you can see that uh, at three and a half grams per kilo per day, we start out close to that with our parenteral nutrition. But if we wean off parenteral nutrition, the shaded area of these bars, too fast, or we don't increase enteral nutrition, the open areas of the bars, fast enough, we end up with fairly long periods of cumulative protein and energy deficits. How much energy? Well, at low energy intakes, less than 80 or so kcals per kilo per day of total energy, clearly you need more energy to produce protein gain. And protein gain is a very energy dependent process, and so you do need it if you're at low energy intakes and should increase energy to advance protein gain. But above 80 to 90, 80 to 100 kcals per kilo per day of total energy, there is no further increase in protein gain for an increase in energy intake. At that point, as even with low energy intakes, protein gain depends on protein intake. Uh, what about higher energy intakes? This is a very nice picture taken from Suda Kashup's work. Uh, she's looking at energy stored on the y-axis, and you can see I've highlighted 35 
that's, it's, that's the normal fetal fat requirements, the energy stored at 100 kcals per kilo per day of energy intake. So anything above an energy intake of 100 kcals per kilo per day is going to produce more energy stored. That's a very nice direct line. But what are we doing to those babies, making them much fatter? Is that a predisposition to obesity? Uh, some studies indicate that might be the case. So what are some of the other consequences of not meeting the normal fetal growth rate? Uh, really, all, as, all anthropometric measurements are diminished. The babies simply grow more slowly. And this is cumulative. You can see here that over 70 days after birth from 25 weeks gestation, so up to 35 weeks, head circumference has gone down, weight has gone down, length has gone down, and there's only a very minimal increase even as they get out towards the 70 days. What about the brain? Well, there are lots of reasons why brain growth might be diminished in the preterm baby, uh, shown in the red lines versus the normally growing fetus. These babies have lots of medical conditions and treatments, dexamethasone, intracranial hemorrhage, sepsis, oxygen, ventilators, necrotizing enteral colitis. All of these could limit brain growth. So nutrition needs to be advanced to the most optimal dosage and quality to counter uh, these many adverse conditions and treatments that clearly are limiting the growth of the brain in, our, in these preterm babies. What diet does promote brain development? Cumulative total intakes of energy and protein shown in many studies over and over again. Cumulative total intakes of energy and protein. Here we're just looking at worse or better MRI scores as a measure of nutrition and uh, neurological development. And you can see that at lower MRI energy score uh, intakes, the, the MRI scores are worse. And when you get up to 100 or so, 107 kcals per kilo per day, MRI scores improve. Uh, energy is the sum of fat and carbohydrate. You see the same curves for those. But you also see worse MRI scores for low protein intake, better MRI scores for higher protein intake maybe not quite up to 4.3, but at least you can see that uh, they get better at higher protein intakes. But also notice that these curves flatten out as you get to these higher dosages. Uh, the point is, while more is better, excess is not, and it could be harmful, not just fat gain, but perhaps some toxicity from protein, excess protein intake. What about assessing nutrition and growth? Tannis has already introduced this, I refer you to Dina, Dina Goldberg's very nice study um, on the consensus indicators of malnutrition, which I've adapted a bit here. Uh, she focused on primary indicators and secondary, secondary indicators. And the primary indicators uh, Tannis has already dealt with, declines in weight for age Z scores or weight gain velocities, declines in length and head circumference growth velocities, consecutive and cumulative days of protein and energy intake that is less than required to maintain desired growth rates. And then, as Tanis pointed out, identify the growth pattern, not just pick an individual value or an individual percentile. Secondary indicators are important also. Look at the days to regain birth weight. Look at the days to achieve desired nutritional intakes. Look at the days to achieve full enteral nutrition and days to achieve full oral nipple feeding. And then look at cumulative days of desired nutritional intakes and cumulative deficits of nutritional intakes. Assess these at least weekly. In conclusion, here's the data and the, or the uh, uh, recommendations uh, from the American Academy of Pediatrics published in their uh, eighth edition of their Pediatric Nutrition Handbook for both parenteral and enteral energy and protein intakes for babies less than a kilo and those one to 1.5 kilos. And I think these very nicely are right smack on what uh, both Tannis and I have been recommending uh, for these. So I'd like to say thank you. And I give a special thanks to my colleagues before I retired, Kendra Hendrickson, a dietitian, and Ashley Riley, a pharmacist, who taught me more in the latter part of my career about nutrition than I learned on my own during my entire career. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Bill.
Um, we do have some time for some questions. Um, so if you if you haven't already uh, posted a question in the bottom, please feel free to post pose a question. Um, we do have a couple here. Um, I think, Bill, this one is for you. How do you know at birth whether an AGA or SGA infant has had intrauterine growth restriction? What a super question. I think if we had that, we could almost all go home. <laughs> um, we've been after our obstetrical colleagues for years to do serial ultrasounds in preterm babies. And uh, they actually, that was done for the intergrowth studies, and uh, they do have very nice curves for uh, ultrasound measurements. Um, so hopefully our obstetrical colleagues will be helping us out more. Um, I think following the mother's clinical condition helps um, and examining the baby at birth. Um, babies that look slightly wasted, thin, uh, tend to be those that were growth restricted. Uh, and so clinical exam helps as well. But clearly what we need to know is how the baby's growing in utero because many babies who, are, who end up AGA, meaning above the 10th percentile, also experienced uh, uh, intrauterine growth restriction. They may have started at the 50th or 70th, 75th. So it's, we can't just rely on them being small for gestational age by some percentile. I wish we could do better, but it's going to take future research. Great. Uh, Tannis, this one is for you. The third baby in your chart gained head circumference greater than the 50th centile whereas length at the 10th centile, is the head growing abnormally or length? Well, to actually answer that question, you know, you'd have to assess the baby. You know, it's always possible that um, there has been a bleed or hydrocephalus going on or, you know, some pathology. But um, our data is showing that babies regain their, or, on, on average, a group of preterm babies grow their heads back to the 50th percentile prior to term, whereas weight and length lag considerably prior to term, uh, so that the population averages for weight and length are not on the 50th percentile. Now, for an individual, you know, you have to treat an individual different than the population, um, but the expectation is that head circumferences do tend to be spared when uh, babies are um, recovering from prematurity and a, a NICU stay and um, any difficulties they have um, occurred. So to me, it doesn't look like pathology, but you can never uh, rule out pathology without taking a closer look. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, is body composition a better indicator of optimal nutrition? Uh, um, why don't I dive in and then uh, you take over, Bill. I'm sure you have something to say. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the emphasis on body composition for preterm babies because the literature is already, I think, overexpressed concern about the percent body fat of preterm infants at, uh, at term age. You may be familiar with the systematic review results. Uh, there are now two of them. There was one by uh, Johnston A.L. published in 2012, and a recent one just published. Uh, um, Niels Rojo is one of the authors. I forget who the first author is. Um, both of those studies point out that if you're looking at percent body fat, preterm infants look like perhaps they might have a problem, but I think the, the real problem is that we should not calculate percent body fat for these babies. If we look at the quantity of lean mass in preterm infants at term age or 40 weeks, their lean mass is much more reduced than their fat mass is elevated. In fact, the fat mass is is not significantly different. It's so what is really different is the lean mass is reduced. And when you divide a number by a lower denominator, you get a higher percentage. So I'm making the point that the at least some of that higher percentage of body fat at that age is actually due to the lower lean mass in these babies. 
And then if you look at the long-term studies that have looked at what happens in terms of body composition over the next three to five months and compare them with term infants, they, uh, the preterm infants slight uh, in higher level of, of body fat is lower because as we all know, term babies put on a lot of body fat in their first few months of life. And at the same time, preterm infants don't continue in that direction. So uh, I, I think the body composition data has put us on a little bit of a, a wrong focus. And I'm concerned that when people start focusing on percent body fat, they might start restricting nutrition which I am really concerned about. I'm also concerned when people want to use BMI because I think we run into the same problem because we know that babies catch up in weight before they catch up in length. And so people, you can calculate a higher BMI than you might expect. So um, I'm, I'm concerned about body composition. I think eventually the, that data will be really useful because we will identify babies who are lagging in lean mass but in the short term i'm really quite concerned about it that we might get off on the wrong track with that data i'll just add in that uh, lean mass i think is the critical thing to focus on as well as brain growth as part of lean mass and in that sense comp body composition to me is valuable we do know that these are reduced in intrauterine growth restriction and they do have adverse effects on development. Um, we just don't have the capacity to measure lean mass at the bedside. Uh, you can use skin calipers to measure body, uh, some estimate of body fat and Sudi Kashup's data that I showed you was done in that uh, way. Uh, so I think there is evidence that you can produce excess fat, but I'm more worried about lean body mass and that's more directly related to protein intake. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one is, with the use of donor breast milk, do we have difficulty in attaining our goal of weight gain? Bill, do you wanna go for that or do you want me to? Which, uh, which one was that? Uh, with the use of donor breast milk, do oh, we have yeah. difficulty in attaining our goal of weight gain? Yeah, if you just use unfortified donor milk, uh, many studies now have shown that weight gain will be less than that from supplemented donor milk and supplemented maternal milk and premature formulas. So you do need to supplement if you want to get the babies to grow on, according to the fetal growth rate. Uh, most places uh, uh, take batches periodically of donor milk and analyze protein and uh, energy uh, and carbohydrate and lipid contents. Um, and uh, to the extent those are staying relatively constant, you can make reasonable guesses at how much supplement to add um, some of them might actually need more than a standard packet of uh, the standard fortifiers. Yeah, excellent, Bill. And I'll just add that uh, systematic reviews have shown that poor growth among baby uh, donor human milk, even if it's fortified. And I could refer you to the Cochrane Review by Quigley. They uh, <clears throat> have published an update of that quite recently. Great. Um, the next question, uh, when do you recommend transition from preterm growth charts to WHO growth charts? Okay, um, I, I suggest that that uh, transition occur at some point between 40 and 50 weeks, you know, whatever works for you clinically. When you make that transition, the um, babies will look like they have dropped percentiles if you make that transition prior to 50 weeks. Um, so our, um, our follow-up clinic locally uses both for that transition time between 40 and 50 weeks. And I think that gives you a better picture of what's going on. Okay, great. Um, the next one, the Villar study demonstrated that weight for length Z-score correlated with body composition better than BMI. Do you agree? Sorry, would you repeat the question? Uh, sure. The Villar study demonstrated that weight for length Z-score correlated with body composition better than BMI. Do you agree? Uh, actually, I have a grad student that is addressing the question of how helpful weight for length um, 
Z scores are, uh, or what, how useful weight for length growth charts are compared to BMI. There are several studies now on term infants that show that <clears throat> BMI is more useful under two years of age for identifying children who have abnormal weight status. And I, I'm aware that the CDC does recommend the use of weight for length uh, charts instead of BMI charts. But a concern I have about weight for length charts and weight for length Z scores is that they aren't based on age and yet uh, body proportionality changes considerably between term and six months and yet we're using the same value of weight for length throughout all those ages all the way up to age two. So at this point I think we need more research and um, a, a lot more transparency about which of these measures are better and in terms of preterm infants I as I mentioned, I do discourage the use of BMI uh, until uh, well after term age. Okay, um, the next one, I would differ about body composition. Lean mass assessment is essential, but neonatology has a long history of trying to manage EGR by focusing on body weight alone. As Bill Hay mentioned, we need to avoid making these infants fat. Um, I guess that's not really a question, just a statement. <laughs> well, I appreciate uh, Lewis Rubin providing that comment. Um, okay. And I think uh, we've all had uh, listened to Tannis and uh, many people question what, what is the predisposition to later adiposity gain and obesity from early life uh, fat gain. And uh, the studies are mixed. And... Uh, uh, marker studies show very clearly that uh, fat mass gain in the one and a half to three year old period for both boys and girls, I uh, forget whether it's boys earlier or girls earlier, uh, was where uh, the later life obesity was uh, primarily pre uh, predisposed to. Uh, I think uh, an infant of a diabetic mother has been produced, has produced excessive amounts of fat and that tends to stay with the baby. So I'm concerned that excess fat might be predisposing to later fat gain, but I agree with Tannis, we need more research to sort that out. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. So um, we see differences in growth of term infants fed exclusive human milk diet versus formula fed diets. Do you think that it's possible for preterm infants with an exclusive human milk diet to exhibit different growth trajectories than those fed formula or formula-based fortifiers? And should we have different expectations? Oh, I'd be happy to dive in. I'm sure Bill has some comments as well. <clears throat> uh, um, I'm also an epidemiologist and from my perspective, I am aware that the WHO growth curves are different from the CDC and the differences have been attributed to the difference in feeding, but it's also possible that those differences in growth are due to the social determinants of health. The uh, WHO growth standard was based on infants who were all from communities in which growth uh, could not have been interfered with by, or wouldn't, hopefully not have been interfered with by economic situations, whereas the CDC growth data didn't show that. And then if you actually look at the CDC data um, that they drew the curves with, they actually have the same pattern of growth that shows up in the WHO growth curve, but they didn't model it to include those. Um, I'm concerned when there's um, too much focus on exclusive human milk um, because my, my biggest concern is meeting nutritional needs and human milk is highly variable and it, it can become a challenge. I think the main thing is we, we do need to support mothers to produce their own milk and then we need to do the best we can to support the babies whether that's uh, um, using a lot of human milk or, or very little. Bill, any comment? Um, last I saw in my own offspring, uh, grandchildren, uh, 
br totally breastfed babies gain a lot of weight and they look very fat and then they lose it um, no matter how long they're breastfed. But there are studies showing that the, the uh, sooner a mother stops breastfeeding and moves on to formula or table foods, uh, uh, the more likely that baby is to gain weight later on. So I think I would agree with Tannis that cultural and dietary practices start entering in and change uh, growth trajectories. Uh, the Academy recommends breastfeeding up to a year of age, uh, at least six months of age. Um, and uh, for the most part, those babies don't retain their body fat that they've gained while breastfeeding. They tend to lose it. And perhaps because of social determinants, these babies are fed a more healthy diet afterwards. Great. Thank you both. I want to extend a huge thank you to both um, Dr. Fenton and Dr. Hay for sharing their expertise with us today. Um, just a reminder for those that may have missed it at the beginning, um, our next webinar is going to be a present presentation by Dr. Nick Hamilton. So um, watch for that invitation in your inboxes. Um, and finally, thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like a copy of both Phil and Tannis's presentation, please send us an email to leah at astartymedical.com and we'd be happy to share that with you. So thank you all so much for joining us and have a great night.